Okay, all right, two weeks. They also made other items used in the series, including net shawls, baskets, kitchen cloths, and embroidered textiles. If you're interested, the Micah Quilt Club is now in person and meets on Wednesdays in Station 205 from 4 to 6 p.m. Anyone is welcome to join. The Zoom group meets once a month on Tuesdays. Check them out. You have a chance to be part of a student club that's nationally active. You can find them at Micah Quilt Group, and I believe the student club president is Maya Malakoff, and Susie Brandt is the faculty sponsor. As far as other Micah connections go, we have many people to thank as we begin our community. The biggest thanks goes, of course, to Dr. King Hammond for sharing her expertise. Thank you to members of the Forum Advisory Committee. Thanks to Undergraduate Studies and Student Affairs for their ongoing support. Thanks to Susie Brandt, Sarah Barnes, and the Micah Book Club. A giant thank you to Forum faculty for taking this bold step to teach a novel in a studio context. Your faculty have been working hard on this. Um, okay. You will note that we, we were meant to have closed captioning for today's lecture. I think the president's visit has delayed our, our closed captioner, so hopefully that will happen. Um, we plan on having that in the future. Um, but for that effort, we thank Katie Earl, George Sisso, Brian Hagerman, and Vital Signs for their services. And last but not least, we thank FYE faculty Jeffrey Penn, who will introduce Dr. Hagerman. Encourage 
individuals like me to go on for advanced studies. So then I went to anthropology, get all the books in anthropology, I could get earth science, loved it, astronomy, loved it, and then I'm looking around at the world, and I don't like what I see. I am very upset with crises that I've been witnessing as a young child. And as I'm looking at the civil rights movement going through the South, and the bus rides, and the dogs, and the hoses, and Emmett Till, which was the first photographic image that changed my entire life, his open casket that his mother requested to be put on a poster and placed on all of the lampposts in the black communities throughout the United States. I was in elementary school, walking, saw this poster, couldn't stop, went on to school. The next day, I left home a half an hour early so I could get back to that lamppost to see what this was. And when I realized what it was, I went home, I went to school, came home, never said a word to my family about it. They never said a word to me. But what it did in my head was crystallize how unfair the world was on so many levels. One last story before I get into making a so that you understand where my head is when I'm doing this and how I've gotten to this point. I finally get to major in art at Queens College, City University of New York. I'm happy as a clam, getting on a bus one day, having a little pretty box. All my brushes fall out. On the floor. What a freaking mess. Okay? New York City. So I'm trying to pick up all my materials. And this woman leans down from her seat to help. She helps me pull all my things together. And as she's doing that, her sleeve rolls up like this. And I look at her arm just because I'm you know, trying to gather my materials. And what do I see on a tattoo? A number. I looked at the number, I looked at her eyes, tears were in her eyes, tears were in my eyes. I closed my box and I went and sat down. At that moment, when I went back to the library, I decided I no longer want to be a human being on this planet because I don't like the way human beings function. I'm going for an alien identity. So I read everything in science fiction I could possibly read. All right? Still going to school, but this is my alter sense. This is my identity that's formed. All right, I go to school. Somehow, miraculously, that's a story for another time. I land a mega fellowship at Johns Hopkins University here in Baltimore. I go, whoa, this is cool. Don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm going to travel this journey and see where it takes me. Finish my doctorate, wondering all the time what am I going to do with all this information from prehistory, Paleolithic history, all the way up to contemporary times? What am I going to do with this stuff? Because basically, as it's taught to you in graduate school, it's flat, it's dull. And you have to put life into it. But then I get the opportunity to start teaching here. Teaching art students was the best learning lesson my life. Because in order to keep you all awake in class, I had to activate art history as a living, thriving, critical element in life. So as I'm doing this, writing and curating and just trying to figure out what to do with all this experience, I gather a lot of colleagues and friends in the area of art history, African American history, women's studies, social justice, you name it. Because I see art in a larger global world. It is a living, breathing thing. But the one thing that kept me constant was my fascination with material culture. Why material culture? My first passion was to be an archaeologist. Why? Because I was amazed how you could dig into the earth, or go into a cave, or stumble upon a finding, and shards and fragments could be put together to reconstruct 
how people lived centuries ago, tens of thousands of years ago. For some reason, it just enormously fascinated me. Fast forward. Here we are. Last January, I get a call from two colleagues. Leslie. Deborah Willis, who is a MacArthur Genius Fellow from 2005 in photography, as is Joyce Jane Scott, Baltimore Micah Artist, 2016. Anyway, Deborah Willis says to me, she said, I got a call from Lowell West, who's a novelist who lives in, in uh, Harlem. She said, um, we got a call from FX Disney. And I said, yeah. And they said, they're looking for somebody to work with them on a movie by Octavia Butler. I went, oh, oh. I said, ooh. I said, the universe is opening up. My ass is old, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> so there's possibilities here. Long story short, they passed my name through. I said, yeah. They said, yeah, this is a story that Octavia Butler wrote when she went to Towler County on the eastern shore of Maryland, did all the research about the plantations there, and wrote this time travel novel about a young woman who travels back to the plantation of her ancestors, white and black, with the soul of them, but keeping them alive, so that her lineage could be alive. I went, oh, this is my stuff. This is looking like my stuff. However, I had not ever worked on a movie project before. I worked with the Brazilian museums and galleries and arts, and you name it, in the community, pop-up shops, you name it. But never done a serious film, and God knows, not with Disney, okay? Not ever with Disney, who had more money than God, all right? So, here we go. Get a call from the producer. And before I got the call, I had done my homework. This is where you as artists come in. Do your homework, do your research, study your subjects, and find out what your passions are. So, because I was inexperienced in this aspect of becoming what they wanted me to be, which was a historical consultant, I said, who else in this field because I didn't want to piss off another colleague who had more experience than me or who should have been included. So the other historical consultant that was approached was a gentleman by the name of Michael Twitter. Google his name. He is a James Beard award-winning chef. That is no small achievement. He knows everything about Southern cuisine. So I mentioned, I said, look, you know, I would be happy to work with you and assist you in any way possible, but you need to talk to Michael Twitty because this is a story that takes place in three bedrooms, an attic, a slave house, and a kitchen. I had already gotten the book. I had already read the book. I had read it in the past, but I said, you need to read it again. Took my notes, so I was ready. The woman says to me, oh yeah, we already talked to Michael. He's on board. Oh, this is really cool. So I said, okay. If this is okay with you, I said, then I can handle all of the other historical interpretations from this period because this is the period of history that I have been studying for the past 30 years. What is making a kingdom about? It's about material culture. What is material culture? Material culture is everything and anything in the geographical landscape that human beings have made. It is, in one scholar's description, in small things considered. It is about those items and objects that if I had become an archaeologist and was able to work in a site and dig up those remnants and shards, I would have had to piece them together to create the narrative of how people live in whatever time period those artifacts gave me once they were tested. 
Okay. Still, I know in my heart of hearts, I am the most inexperienced person of color to do this. Because I've never done a film before. Never had this experience. Talk to the producer. The producer passes me to the director. The director, quick interview. I can't believe that I'm being hired so fast. And then I get a, sh a call from the showrunner. The showrunner is the person who handles the entire interpretation of Octavia Butler's book, Kindred, into a script. He hires probably in the number of 10, 12 script writers to take on various episodes. But my job, my job, not only is it to work with the script writers, all 24, excuse me, 24 rewrites and at least 10 of them who were hired. I also had to work with all the crew chiefs, of which there are 25 who made a film. All right? So in the first meeting with all the crew heads, it was absolutely a knockout because Michael Twitty and I had to answer that question. And their principal question was, one, we are not going to mess up. I'll tell you what this for. Two, we know this is a story about slavery. Three, how, how, when we are filming and casting actors, do we show the resistance of slavery? Because none of you were born when Roots was made, which was the first. Okay, those of us who are old enough to remember. Okay, you all never saw that one, which came from the Alice Haley book, all right? And was sort of like, you know, theatrical, sensational, it's a lot of descriptive words, but it was not the real deal. So this crew that I'm working with were obsessed with telling the real story. Because as I talked to them, I said, I don't want to work on this if you are going to mess up our table about the story and you are going to mess up the historical truths that she embedded in the narrative of her history. Everyone assured me. And as we began to talk, things began to emerge. My first call was from the prop master. This is only two of probably five sheets of the material, culture, artifacts that he was charged with the responsibility of finding. And, by extension, my job to help him locate these objects, wherever they might be, Goodwill, Saviors, Savers, uh, uh, Value City, uh, uh, Value Village, any thrift shop, flea market, whatever could be found where we could find these things. The lists were made out to identify artifacts that enslaved people might have. Now remember, if you are an enslaved person, I'm going to use the word not slave or, or slavery, I'm going to say enslaved, okay? If you were an enslaved person, you were not allowed to own anything but usually the tools or the materials that you need in order to expedite the jobs or the assignments of your role on that plantation. All right? You were not allowed to learn how to read or write. Being caught either teaching somebody reading or writing or you reading or writing or someone having capacity to translate books or whatever could be penalized by death, and in some parts of the South, these two fingers were cut off. So you could not hold a pen or write it in a It was a vicious system. However, the irony with reading and writing is that the one book that African Americans could get access to was the Bible. Why? Because Christianity was in a movement in the United States to increase its flock, and the American Bible Society would begin to pass Bibles out through the community. So 
eventually towards the aftermath of the Civil War, you would find more African Americans learning to read vis-a-vis -vis using the Bible. The only difference is, is that the Bible's stories that were understood by white communities were not the same stories that were understood and interpreted by African centered people or indigenous people because they also tried to convert as many indigenous communities as possible. Okay, so as this prop master is now on the phone with me, he's located in Los Angeles. The movie is, takes place, the story takes place in Eastern Shore, Maryland, Talbot County, that is in the region where Harriet Tubman was active with the Underground Railroad. And the prop master is now telling me, well, we're not going to shoot, the movie's not going to be shot in Maryland, it's going to be shot in Georgia. Disney has found a track of land outside of the airport, and they are building an entire city, state, plantation complex. Okay. After an hour and a half, this man is nearly hysterical with me on the phone. Until he gets to the point where he starts talking about, oh my God, and I need to have quilts, because I have all these bedrooms. I have all these rooms that have to be outfitted. And he's talking, I said, whoa, slow down. Slow down, breathe. I said, you're having, we have reached a critical crossroad here because I know this is a Disney production. But Disney can probably afford the purchase of one quilt, one Maryland-made quilt from 1810 to about 1815. But you have so many rooms that need this. He said, no, the problem is worse than that. And I said, why? He said, everything that's on that list has to be in duplicates. Twos. Everything has to be in twos. Why? Wow. Could have an accident. After it's my guffaw, lose it, whatever. They have to have two of everything. So by now, he's literally screaming at me on the cell phone, and I'm in Trader Joe's, and I'm like, <laughs> So uncool. People don't know what I'm doing because now I'm getting nervous. He's making me nervous. And I said, Could you just hold on for about three days? Just give me three days. I think I have a solution. And that's when I go to the quilt club, which had been meeting during the entire pandemic, zooming, making quilts. Sarah, stand up so they see you. Sarah, please. without Sarah. So I pitched, I pitched this to the Zoom club. When I was talking like this and not paying to all the pictures, when I looked up on the screen, everybody was like this. They were like, when do we start? When do we start? Because you have to understand that the quilt club here has been committed to making quilts that help raffle off and make money to support students who are in need or whatever, and when we're not doing that, we pick a social justice cause, initiative, organization, and we make a quilt in honor of them, give it to them, they can raffle it, auction it, or keep it for their collection. So this was the perfect project at the perfect time with the most awesome, incredible people. Okay. I mean, not to be underestimated at all. So now let me give you the history. How did I do this? Well, I have all of this, and I have this huge crew, and they want me to do this project. I still got to figure it out. Sarah has already leaped forward, and she has pulled out every quote book, because you have to understand that Maryland, the state of Maryland, has one of the most extraordinary traditions. The best collections are located in the Maryland Center for History and Culture, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and the Walters Art Gallery. Phenomenal. There are quilts in there where women have made from scraps over 5,000 pieces. Now, if women can do that, they can run the world. So what do I do? I'm a historian. I had to 
and get focused. I have to get centered, all right? I love to stitch. I love to do all of this. My grandmother was a master seamstress. Worked in Seventh Avenue Garment District for her whole lifetime when she migrated from Barbados. So I knew this culture. I knew this culture. But I had to get into the district. So this is a house. James Rice House, located in Annapolis, Maryland, right here. The University of Maryland Archaeological Department is charged with the responsibility of doing all the archaeological excavations in this state for every piece of property that is owned or designated state-related. This building is in enormous condition. Built in 1766 to about 1781 um, or 80. It is very plain on the inside with minimal ornamentation and plastic decorations, all right? But as the archaeologists are beginning to deconstruct the history of this building, They are looking at the floor plan and things that were found underneath the floorboards. All right? Okay. Now, this is what I mean about things hidden in plain view. This is what I mean about simple, ordinary, found things, broken things, things that you have that you just can't get rid of. You all have it. Every last one of us suffer with the disease of stuff. Okay, if you're not an American, you will be Americanized because we suffer from conspicuous consumption. All right? We just got all kinds of just as my son calls it random areas. Okay? And we keep it. One area, we lost one. Look at me. I'm going to have to find the other area, so I just go on to okay. Somewhere in my stockpile, it will emerge, and if it doesn't, I'm keeping these two. All right? So here, the archaeologists find in this floor plan some signifying, this is what we call an African American sensibility, signification. Signification is a means of codifying or attaching symbolic, intentional, purposeful meaning to specific sites. So what do we see here? You see an elliptical form, right? You also see that the elliptical form is crossed, all right? This is what we call the Congo culture in the Angola region of Africa, a cosmogram. Why the hell would a cosmogram be in this house? Well, guess who built the slave, uh, excuse me, the James Brown's race house? It was African enslaved people. All right? And what they did was they put a signature on the floor plan to protect the enslaved individuals who had to work on that plantation and traverse through that space. Okay, I'm going to come away from this. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Now, at the top and at the bottom are the heart. Okay? Heart is nothing but a fireplace. Why do you have two? Look at the size of that James Grace house. That's something that's big. Okay? How are you going to hear? Remember. We have heat. In our houses, in our buildings, it's hot in this room. We got lights. They didn't have any of this. Okay, so you have the heart, you have the heart. You have the door over here. You remember in the James Grace, I should have put two images aside. You have the door over here. Now, in the center, you see another circle. At the top part, you see a circle, and over by the door, you see a circle. The two small circles were cash.
like junk, don't it? Looks like nothing. Alright? If you ever find anybody's bundle tied up like this, don't look at it. Be afraid of it today. Because whoever made that bundle made it for healing, protective purposes. The archaeologists were absolutely flat that. Why? Because the African retentions were so important. This is what we call a cache of divination. All right? Elements of materials that are pulled together so that when they come together, each one of the elements maintains and contributes to its own sense of power. Remember, once I had a class that I was teaching on, on, on uh, African traditional African art form. Everybody was obsessed about Udon and witchcraft and evenness. Margaret's bedroom. 
This was the guest room, Kevin, the primary character, who finds himself drawn into this time zone thing. This is the room that he occupies. This is Rufus's bedroom, who is the element who keeps calling Dana back through the time zone. This is his room. This is the office of Dana, the master. This is the library, the sacred place, where no slaves are supposed to be taking the books off the shelf. You may dust the shelves. You may not take the books off, take them down, look at them, read them. This is where Dana constantly is having interactions with the master of the house. So she can read. This is the entry hall. This is to let you know what the homes were like at that time. Notice on the walls, too, there were paintings. This is a kind of like a mid-level bourgeois plantation. This is the parlor, where you would have a piano. In the story, they place the piano, but this is where all kinds of readings and uh, poetry and songs were presented. And this is the dining room, the formal dining room. Trust me, it's not where we ate, that's where we served. These are the slave houses in Maryland that still exist. And we have to make quilts for all of the bedrooms and for the slave house because as Dana meets her mother, who has also been trapped in the South Time Zone, she is in her own house. All right, just to let you know what we did as a quote club. This is a quote that the quote club made, the AKQB and Michael Quote Club, that we made for Susan Brent as a gift, the double sided quote, to show you the level of complexity and the work that we did. In this particular one, each participant on this quote was given the full opportunity whatever design or creation. And Sarah, you went to Sarah, didn't you? I know. Yeah, you helped know, putting this one together. This is one quilt, double side. These are some of the quilts that we made as a quilt club. So that you know that we had the skills, we had the chops. Right? Now as we are working on putting all the materials together, we get one main problem. And that was we had members in the quilt suite who could not be physically present in Mosher, which is the space we were given, the first floor, to participate in this project, but they wanted to do so. So Sarah, genius that she is, came up with the idea of making slave quilts out of what we call postage stamp size. So these were two inch by two inch? Yeah. yeah inch by two inch squares. So how did we do this? We told each person on Zoom who couldn't be physically present to make two panels, two panels identically alike. Why? Because of course we needed everything to do. And if everybody made two panels of postage stamp quilts, then we could make a quilt and have an extra one as a backup. Also, too, while working, it occurred to me, I went, oh my God, this is a time when also nothing is wasted. Absolutely nothing. Not the shards of soap, nothing. I remember growing up, because I, I was also raised by depression culture parents. Those of you remember that, okay? Waste not, want not. We saved all the soap shards. We put them together in a cup, okay, with a little water, and you made another bar of soap. So I said, damn it. Master, and I said, look, tell the costume master that I need all of their scraps. And they sent me the scraps so that Sarah and I and all the makers could incorporate. So you see on the bottom this stripe material, all this stripe material, that was from the costume part. In order to contextualize all of the elements in the house and to have continuity artifacts that we were creating. Do you understand? Waste not, want not. Remember, this is a time when they don't have it in Walmart. There is no Amazon. There is no China to make everything that you can get it from. Okay? You have to do everything down to the woven cloth. I'm still, they saw until 
made by hand, and nothing was wasted. If you want to see this tradition in play, the Japanese also have wonderful usage of recycled materials. These are some of the quilts that we ended up making. This is this is the one that I can move down, right? Yes, because it was just a little bit too bright. There were certain colors that were not available at that time because now we have a lot of other chemical additives to the pigmentation of the fiber. So when the fabrics came in, even if they were new and they were too bright, the other thing is that we could not use white, white fabrics because they pop on the camera, okay? And it would throw the balance of the whole cinematic scene off. I would take it home and I would die. This is how the post stand quilts were constructed. We used the floor to lay out. Thank God we had all of that space. On the left hand side was an old quilt that I had found in a building here in Baltimore. It was dirty, it was filthy. We were going to throw it away, and I recognized it as somebody's handwork. I am also fascinated with the handwork that women do knitting, crocheting, tatting, weaving, whatever. I recognize this as an old book. It was used, loved, worn, and beat the hell up. So what we did was is we cut it in half, all right, and we added some of the scraps from the costume department, and we made two quilts, and this is, these were slave quilts. These were slave quilts because they would have been given the scraps, the leftovers from the master quilts. Now we get to the master quilts. This is Margaret's, right? This is Margaret. The centerpiece was done by Susie Brent, who came in and did a special applique technique because, of course, we were taking our full on full time to make these quilts. I think we had a lot of time. And while I'm standing in the middle of the room, the prop master is calling me telling me that the camera crew has shifted its shoot schedule and they need the quotes in two weeks. And so we made nearly 30 quotes in two weeks, packed them up in FedEx boxes. I love to go into FedEx and say, just send them off. And they said, but you know this is going to be expensive. I said, it's Disney. <laughs> when, the, when the quilt boxes arrive, Prop master called me and he said he opened up the boxes. He said, and magic came out of the boxes. He said the camera crews went crazy. So here is well, these are Margaret quilts. This is um this is Kevin. That's Kevin's. Okay, and then the minute I think the minute that Sarah over there, we had five stations. Sewing, five stations for ironing, because if you've done this work before, you know that you need to flatten the seams and get everything aligned. I didn't do so well. Sarah pulled a lot of my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I was not as expertise as she was. Here I am, and on the back of the slave book, the closest stands books were back to burlap. Not, they were not enough regular linen cotton fabric to back the slave quilt. So typically they would use burlap bags that were used to shut corn and all other produce that was common of the day. I placed a cotton frame on the back of each quilt because it not only served as a symbolic gesture on our part to protect the enslaved, but it also became a technique to hold the quilt together because we didn't have time to do all the hand tying or stitch and ditch or all the other techniques because we had to get the quilts out. Here is the center panel for um, uh, the quilt. And those blue birds, those will be embroidered ones. Yeah, the back piece was uh, hand colored. Right. Sarah, you can't hear you back. Stand up. Oh, or like, can we use the mic for? Sorry, I can 
burn kitchen match. Those are things that I found in antique shops for the dining room, for the fresh, you know, the special dinners, the big Christmas dinner scene. This is how we made the table settings for the uh, chef. This is the end. It's Sarah, it's me, and it's one of our stitchers, Molly Sims, as she was finishing off the last quilt. Sarah is finishing off the pillowcase. Uh, applique and I am so applique going to the pillowcase to match the quilts. I got to go last week to meet the characters, the actors. So there's Dana and, and Kevin, those are the two character actors. Uh, um, uh, Kevin, uh, this is name Micah. This name is Micah, and I got her name when she was in Micah right now. And this is Luke, who played the slave intermediary who, who runs through the woods. And that part. And the woman with the long braids is the producer who hired me. When we all finally met, both of them would stand in the room and scream. <laughs> we just screamed at each other. And the actor said it was so much easier for them to do the transition of their parts into their roles with the artifacts that we made because it set the stage and 